Good morning and welcome to the second SDP Dallas workshop. Today we will discuss how to maximize our brand voice and marketing. Don't forget that we're on social media at SDP Dallas um, and during this time you can um, tweet and um, also tag your post with hashtag SVP D workshop. Hello, my name is Prisma Garcia and I'm the Director of Capacity Building with SVP Dallas. Today we'll engage in a conversation with uh, an organization called CAP EQ uh, with Ty Nisha Boyer Robinson. And we'll also have some of our SVP partners that are you know, experts and specialists in marketing. So with us today we have Chris Kroger, Maddie Kulkarni, and Steve Dennis. The idea for today and for these workshops is for us to engage in conversations with business leaders, both for-profit and non-profit, so that we learn together and we hear from an organization that's on the ground. So we're, this is an experience of mutual learning and we hope that you will um, engage in this conversation and submit your questions in the chat. Um, so we'll start off with um, some brief introductions. I'm gonna pass it over to Chris Kroger for his quick introduction. Thanks, Prisma. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Prisma said, my name is Chris Kroger. And after about 25 years in corporate sales and marketing, I shifted gears a few years ago to teaching and giving back to the uh, community. Uh, I'm a, a member of uh, Social Venture Partners, a partner there and uh, a member of their board. And I'm uh, very much looking forward to our conversation today. So with that, I'll hand it over to Maddie. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, everyone. I'm Maddie Kulkarni. I am a past SVP board member. I've been with the organization since 2015. And I can say that SVP Dallas has helped me get a richer understanding of our local community and provide a training ground for the job that I'm currently in with PepsiCo. So my corporate life is with PepsiCo as the Global Marketing Director of Purpose and Sustainability. This means my job is to make sure our brands and our marketers are bringing purpose and sustainability to life for our consumers in our brand's voices. Uh, outside of PepsiCo, my community life, um, I am the executive director of Dallas Heroes Project, where we do marketing for nonprofits. I'm the vice chair of Impact, which is a social enterprise arm of my possibilities. And I'm on the advisory board of the University of Texas at Dallas's undergraduate marketing program. With that, I'll turn it over to my friend, Steve. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Steve Dennis. I've been an SVP partner. I think it will be uh, close to nine years uh, this month. And uh, my day job, so to speak, uh, I do strategic advisory work and speak and write on uh, primarily on innovation and digital disruption, uh, mostly in the retail space, but in some other areas as well. Thank you, Stephen, Maddie, and Chris. Um, we're going to jump into an introduction and a description of CAP EQ. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ty um, to discuss more about her organization. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. I'm Tynesha Boye Robinson. I am the president and CEO of CAP EQ. And CAP EQ stands for Capitalism and Emotional Quotient or Emotional Intelligence, which is really about changing how the world does business in a way that is driving equity for low income people and people of color. And so if you think about what we do every day, uh, we're an impact investing and advisory firm. And we believe that doing well and doing good is actually a competitive advantage. And we do that by partnering with public sector, philanthropy, and companies to design for impact, build with impact, and grow through impact. Our team is, our full-time folks are me and Tracy Jarman, who's our chief of staff, she's amazing, but we actually work with a network of subject matter experts across the country, um, dozens and dozens who have actually worked and driven change in their industries. 
And at CAPIQ, our clients are our partners. So we really believe that in order to drive lasting change, you have to partner together to achieve that. And so these are a few of our partners and our work has been highlighted across the country by different um, organizations, including my book, Just Change, How to Collaborate for Lasting Impact. So I'm excited to pick the brains of these wonderful marketing and brand experts on the call. And I'm hopeful that you'll follow us on Twitter. You'll uh, join us and take our CAPIQ Impact assessment to see just how is your Cappy Q. And I am a proud C Corp member of the Social Venture Partners Dallas. Thank you, Ty. Um, we know that we have a diverse audience and that we may have people that are um, in working in, non in nonprofit organizations or for-profit organizations, small business, just a, a wide range of audience participation today. And so we wanted to give the marketing experts some time to highlight more about where, where they're coming from. We know that we have Chris coming from more of an academic background, um, you know, with some experience in corporate, and he'll discuss that. Maddie, um, you know, really deep into the corporate, um, corporate work now and um, Steve, of course, with being a retail expert. And so I'm, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris so that he can share with us, um, you know, just a quick five minute deep dive on his, um, on his work. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Prisma. And as uh, Maddie did a little earlier, just, just a little more background. I mentioned 25 years in uh, corporate sales and marketing. I was with a company called Saber Travel uh, Technology Space we were in and uh, I finished my career there. Uh, as chief uh, marketing officer for that uh, organization. And then I decided to shift gears and uh, focus on giving back through kind of education and community work. So I currently teach uh, foundational marketing at TCU and I also uh, guest lecture down at UT Austin, my alma mater, uh, where I'm also the chair of their master's in uh, marketing uh, advisory council. And then through social venture partners and, and, and in some cases outside of social venture partners, I've given back to the community uh, by helping a variety of, of different social impact organizations with a common theme, helping teens and young adults, um, you know, get on the right path in life. So it's been a very rewarding last few years being part of uh, Social Venture Partners and, and driving and accelerating greater impact. So with that, as a, as a little bit of a, a additional background, I'm going to focus in on marketing fundamentals. Uh, this is what I teach at TCU and what we thought might be good to start our session today is an opportunity to create a baseline of what marketing is, what it isn't, and how important it is, particularly in today's uh, current times. And with that baseline, then the other experts, uh, Maddie, Steve, and Ty, will really be able to build upon uh, that, that foundation. So with that, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to start with uh, a, a commercial, uh, an advertisement here. Let me show it to you, and then we'll talk about it in a little bit more uh, detail. So uh, your seat good? Get the mirrors all adjusted. You can see everything okay? Just stay off the freeways, all right? I don't want you going out on those yet. Just leave your phone in your purse. I don't want you texting. Okay? Daddy, okay. Okay. There you go. Be careful. Thanks, Dad. Call me, but not while you're driving. We knew this day was coming. That's why we bought a Subaru. So uh, I, uh, I love that commercial for a variety of, uh, of different reasons. And I use it in my uh, class. Hold on just a second, sorry. Let me get back to my slides real quick. Uh, I use that in my class to illustrate uh, a, a couple points. Uh, one is that marketing uh, and advertising in particular can be very powerful. Uh, there's a science to the marketing that that campaign there was very much focused on uh, safety and love of a parent for a child and buying a product that will deliver on that love uh, through safety. So clear target market, clear uh, you know, message, et cetera. There's also an art to marketing. It's very emotional, attached to me. My daughter was driving about that uh, same exact time and that's exactly what it felt like, little girl uh, becoming a, a grown adult. Uh, so that's one way of, of telling a story. That's, that's advertising, right? The, the, uh, one of uh, five promotional tools, different ways to tell your story. You've got advertising, you've got public relations, events, uh, 
press releases, those kinds of things. You got sales promotion, which is typically around price. Uh, you got personal selling, you have social media, which is really today's uh, modern marketing with its own set of tools, but also a vehicle to deliver these other promotional tools. So all taken together, uh, that's what's considered your promotional mix. If you are in a business and you're uh, doing marketing, you've got a promotional mix. But even that is only one piece of, of marketing. In fact, those of you who remember your four Ps, the promotional mix is just one P. It's promotion. And uh, that is one of four. You've got your marketing mix. You've got your product. You've got your place, price, promotion. So in this case, the product is a car. The place is a dealership. Price is a moderately priced car. Promotion, they chose advertising to promote. I didn't share with my class that there's a lot of different definitions of product, right? You've got tangible products like a car or a can of soda, Pepsi. Uh, you've got services, uh, consulting, uh, accounting, uh, retail, restaurants, et cetera. And you have nonprofits, right? You have people and ideas, LeBron James, Taylor Swift, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, you know, that's all marketing. Uh, but for these purposes, let's talk nonprofits for a second. A lot of times people think nonprofits are different than the rest of the business world when it comes to marketing. And except for one thing, I would propose nonprofits operate in the same marketing ecosystem that any other business does. In the case of product providers and service providers, they're selling a product that delivers customer value. In the case of nonprofits, they're delivering programs that create impact. Right. Other than that difference, everything else about the marketing ecosystem I propose is the same. And that includes taking your marketing mix and making sure it's going after a very clear target market. In this case, it was young adults driving, teens driving was also the parents of those young adults. In the case of nonprofits, you have multiple stakeholders. You got your clients that you're actually serving. You got donors, you got politicians, you got government, you got a variety of different elements to your target market. Those target markets don't fall out of the sky. You gotta do research, you gotta get data, you gotta understand consumer insights to understand that target market inside and out. Uh, people make decisions in different ways. Consumers decide certain ways. Uh, businesses decide other ways. Understanding the decision-making process, the psychology of why I buy, or in many cases, why I donate to a particular cause. Understanding that is critical from a marketing perspective. It'd be great if we operated uh, just by ourselves, but we don't. We're in a marketing environment that's got competitors and lots of noise and economic factors and a variety of other things that happen. And increasingly that is taking place on a global stage. A lot of what we do sometimes is local, but it's impacted by what's happening from a global perspective. And all of this starts with strategy and planning and ultimately the mission. What is the mission of the organization? So. I start my classes by asking what is marketing and most students say it's advertising. And then what I try to show them is that marketing is way more than advertising. It's this complex ecosystem of different steps along the way that lead up to that tip of the spear to that advertisement, but there's a lot that goes on behind it. So I share all of that with you as a foundation because it's across this entire spectrum that we ask the question for today, how do we make our brand voice more relevant? How do we execute marketing better? Well, it's across all these areas that we need to think about doing that. So where has coronavirus impacted things, right? Clearly, it's a marketing environment, a global environment change uh, that is unprecedented, literally, literally in the last hundred years, and certainly in our lifetimes, haven't seen anything like it. And so uh, that's the first place to understand is that this has had a major shock to the system for you as your business. Then you have to look at what does that mean to my target market? What impact does that have on my clients? What impact does that have on my donors, my other stakeholders? From there, it's time to do a little bit of a mission check. It's like, okay, my mission was this before. Now with this environmental change, with these potential impacts to my target market, do I have a mission change? Do I need to modify? Do I need to radically transform it? Then out of that mission change, is there a change to my product? What I deliver, the programs I deliver? Do I expand them? Do I narrow them? What do I do? And then ultimately it gets to whether there's any changes because it very well could be that while there has been a impact to the marketing environment, it hasn't fundamentally changed my target market. If anything, it's just exposed a greater need in that target market. So my mission stays the same, my programming stays the same. Let's say that that's your conclusion. Well, even with that, the way you promote, the way you storytell is likely 
uh, needs to change. And that's what we're gonna end up talking about today. So this looks pretty complex. I try to simplify it with my marketing team at Saver. If you think about it, this is really three things, strategies, solutions, and stories. Strategy is everything from the idea to, uh, graphic there all the way to target market, that's setting your strategy. Solutions is about your product place and price. And stories is about your storytelling, your promotion. And that's what great marketing does. It seamlessly blends strategy, solutions, and stories, making sure that they're interconnected. You don't have a disconnect between your story and your solution and your strategy. And then when it comes to telling your story, uh, the best brand voices do three things really well. Uh, they have authenticity, consistency, unity. Authenticity means uh, your actions match your words. Everything you do at every point in your organization, particularly on the marketing side, is authentic. Your actions uh, uh, match your, your words. Uh, consistency, that you uh, have a core message, you stick to it, you're disciplined to it, and you repeat it just ongoing all the time. It's just very consistent. And unity means that everything is integrated together. Solutions, your strategy, solutions, and stories, but also your promotional mix. What you're saying potentially in advertising to versus emails to donors versus a uh, interview you might do on TV, everything has to be united in how you tell that story. Okay, so those are the fundamentals of marketing. We wanted to set the stage there because again, the next three speakers are gonna go much deeper and bring this to life. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Maddie. Awesome, thanks, Chris. Share my screen here. Wow. Okay, so everyone just got a five minute crash course. He took a semester's worth of marketing and put it into five minutes. That was highly impressive, Chris. Um, now I'm going to pivot a little bit and show some examples of how corporate brands are rising up to the challenge um, in this COVID-19 situation and winning share of voice um, in the way they are executing their campaigns. And there's two principles uh, which make for effective social impact marketing programs. And those are one, to be timely and relevant, and two, to stay aligned to your purpose. And at first blush, they might look like two contradictory things. You want to be timely, but you want to stay rooted and consistent to your purpose. And the best marketers know that the best stories have tension, have conflict, have juxtaposition. And so in that sense, I want to unpack both of these principles. The first example of being timely and relevant um, that I'd like to show is this Nike uh, campaign that dropped on March 21st. Uh, I'll just read what they posted on Twitter. If you ever dreamed of playing for millions around the world, now is your chance. Play inside, play for the world. And the reason this campaign is so brilliant is that it follows the tread of dreaming, right? So you had the dream crazy ad with Colin Kaepernick. Then after a few months, there was dream crazier with Serena Williams. Following that dreaming thread, the consumer now, the reader, becomes the center of this story. The consumer is dreaming of playing for millions, but the juxtaposition happens when they're saying you can play from home, right? Um, Nike is showing how they're still relevant uh, in today's COVID-19 um, situation. Um, and I, I just love this campaign. The second campaign um, that shows how being timely and relevant is possible here is with Ikea. And I'm going to play this campaign and, and watch how it says, maybe this is the time to rearrange the furniture. Yo soy tu hogar y voy a estar para ti, aguantando todo lo que venga. 
Right, and this was a campaign that launched in Spain. It's in Spanish, it's dubbed in English. Um, but it shows the relevance IKEA still has in our lives while we're quarantined at home, right? Th now might be the time where you might be thinking, hmm, maybe I need to order another Billy bookcase from IKEA. So the implication to our social impact organizations becomes, how do we share the relevance our brands have in this new normal? So now going to the second principle, staying aligned to the brand's purpose. Uh, you might have seen uh, the new Courage is Beautiful advertisement from Dove. And this shows the alignment Dove has continued um, around this concept of real beauty and self-esteem. So years ago, you might remember the campaign where you saw the image of the model under undergo massive amounts of makeup transformation, photoshopping, airbrushing, before her visual was then put up on a billboard, right? You might have seen the campaign where women are asked, hey, do you think you're beautiful? And most women say, well, I, I feel like I'm average, right? So Dove has been rooted in real beauty and self-esteem. And I wanna show you the, the new ad, the Courage is Beautiful ad, where look at the, the portrait images that they show um, and you'll see the, the marks of face masks on the frontline healthcare workers that are highlighted. campaign felt like a campaign from Dove, right? It didn't feel so far off. They didn't change their operations completely. They're staying rooted and aligned, consistent to the point that Chris made earlier uh, to their brand's purpose. So the implication to our social impact organizations and our nonprofits, how do we communicate to our stakeholders that while we're pivoting, we are staying committed to our purpose? And the final point I wanted to make was that we don't need new budgets, big budgets to make this happen. Um, the exciting uh, you know, thing that I'm seeing is we are now becoming so creative in the way we execute our marketing campaigns. It's no longer that we need these large ad production budgets. Um, this is the last video I'll show you, but the commercial director shot this uh, uh, with his own daughter, with their own family dog. Um, in their own backyard with his own camera. So take a look at this last one. so simple um, and, and done on the cheap, right? Um, I'll give you one more example. El Arroyo is a restaurant in Austin, Texas. Uh, they started margarita delivery. And every day on Instagram, they post an image of the sign they have outside their restaurant. This one's promoting the margarita delivery. And subsequent signs kind of show how this is helping to employ people who have lost their jobs uh, in the restaurant industry. Guys, Instagram is free. Um, so the implications to our social impact organizations are we have to get creative in the way we communicate our message, right? Humor can go a long way with these last two examples. Um, you know, that's an illustration of that. But we also have to use our judgment, given the sensitivities of the time. And we can use what we have, free social media channels, email, the camera video app on your phone. Um, the sky's the limit. So with that, I would like to... Pass the baton now to my friend, Steve Dennis. Thank you, Maddie. See if I can get my, uh, 
Whoops. Yeah, this would screw up. Hold on. Are you seeing my screen? Yes? Yes, we can see. All right, good. All right, now I just gotta get it in slideshow mode and we'll be, we'll be all set. So um, just again, to follow up with a little bit more detail on my, on my background. So I, I spent um, many years in the corporate world. I've been out on my own consulting for the past 10 years or so and doing a lot more speaking and writing uh, last three years for Forbes magazine. About a month ago, I had a book come out that um, I'll be sharing a few ideas from that in a second, uh, but it's primarily focused on retail. And then um, in terms of social impact work, I've worked with, I don't know, probably a dozen or so different organizations in town, some of them for profit, like uh, the Ecola Project and Abby Farron, um, others more in the non-traditional or in the more traditional nonprofit world. Um, I'm going to take perhaps a little bit broader view, but hopefully drive this to some things that I think really uh, are driving overall brand performance and marketing in particular. Uh, but particularly if you think about the impact of digital technology over the last 20 years or so, but certainly over the last four or five, it's driven some really seismic change. The, the main one, which is, which is very much the premise of my book, is that things that used to be fairly scarce or um, constrained have really become highly abundant. So if you think about how much our choices of media have gone up for good or bad over the last 20 years, the kind of information on products, on, on prices, on reviews, you name it, that are available in a nanosecond, our ability to get access to products and services in some cases from all over the world, the choices that we have among those, those points of distribution, um, the whole new way convenience has been redefined, whether that's digital delivery of content or it's Amazon grocery delivery, those sorts of things. And just the way we're connected to people, obviously this, is, this alone is a great example of that, but the way we think about our networks uh, today compared to what they looked like five, 10, 15 years ago is, is tremendously different. And then just the sheer cost of things for the most part has gone down. Data being the most, and storage being the most obvious ones, but in many cases, particularly in the retail world, there are a lot more um, cheap options available or it's really easy for you to find the easiest price. Um, the other thing, and, and those of us that are closer to my age will remember when we first went online, that was a very intentional act, did the AOL dial up thing in some cases, and going online for the most part was done from our home or from our office. Um, but today, essentially, most of us are living online. Uh, we no longer have to plan going online. We don't have to dial up. Uh, most of us are pretty, for, again, for better or worse, are pretty much connected, tethered to our smart devices 24-7. Well, so what? From a marketing standpoint, um, not only uh, is the customer driving the marketing connection more so than brands were driving it in the future, but also our, our customer, our client can go from doing one thing to another in a second. And in many cases, of course, are doing multiple things at the same time. So, so the way digital technology, digital disruption has, has changed the world of business more broadly, uh, but in particular marketing is, is pretty astounding. So now we live in a world where our priorities have shifted. You know, the thing on the left is obviously a bit of a joke, but I think it speaks to really how a lot of people feel about what's important. Um, but when you think about what's scarce now, you know, if product access and, and information access and so forth is no longer scarce, the scarce resource is time, it's uh, loyalty, it's earning trust with those people that we are in relationship with. And what that's set up for uh, in uh, marketing context is this ever escalating battle for attention. Uh, we are constantly distracted. We have this whole tsunami of information and choice out there and for the marketer or the brand or the company, whatever uh, organization you're in, you have to first get your client's attention. And that is harder and harder all the time. If you cannot earn their attention, you are not going to sell them anything or persuade them to take action on the things you want to. So the fundamental um, challenge, I think, is 
even good enough or excellent is oftentimes not good enough anymore to earn attention in the first place or to earn the sale or the transaction or the relationship. Uh, and it's certainly not good enough to really create the kind of loyal uh, relationships we want over the long, long term. So my last slide is, or my second to last slide is this fundamental challenge. When we're in this very noisy world, this battle for attention, the constantly distracted consumer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, what do we need to do to become that really compelling, intensely relevant signal amid all the noise? And so I borrowed pretty heavily uh, from, some would say steel, stolen, from um, my friend Seth Godin who wrote a book a number of years ago, which I, I would recommend called Purple Cow. Uh, and it's this idea of becoming remarkable. Now there's two ways of thinking about remarkable. There's the one we probably most commonly would think about, which is really distinctive, highly unusual, um, something we would really notice, something that would stand out like the purple cow in a field of black cows. But the more important thing I would say from a brand and marketing standpoint is how do we create a story that people want to talk about? that is literally remarkable. Those are the most powerful brand messages. And, I, and as I hopefully have uh, shared a little bit with you, and we'll talk about a little bit more, but how, how do we do that in this ever noisy world? I think the implications from um, the pandemic is that the distractions, the noise has gone, you know, even to a whole new level, has been amplified greatly and presumably will be for at least, you know, some time. Uh, and the second thing is, from a marketing standpoint, people are operating much more so from a place of fear than would be typical. Uh, with any luck, that will start to subside, but I think we have to be pretty mindful uh, of that. So I think I'll end with that and turn it back over to Prisma, I guess, or are we going to tie? So um, I'm going to jump in. I think, um, you know, we've heard these different messages from all of our panelists and now we want to hear a little bit more from Ty to hear about what she's encountering as a social impact organization herself and then also as she's talking and consulting with different clients you know their boots on the ground too so we want to hear from from you Ty um, so I'll turn it over to you. Sounds great. Well, first of all, I am so lucky that SVP Dallas is allowing me to tap these brains for free which is great. I'm going to leverage and suck up all their juices and give it to my partner clients and they're going to be excited about it. And, you know, I, you know, stepping back, if you think about COVID-19, it's changed all of our lives, you know, the, and it's mine, yours, maybe you're a business owner and a preschool teacher now, maybe you're an educator full time and you have your kids running around. Maybe you're a healthcare worker and you're trying to figure out how you're going to feed your family while keeping people alive. And, even though COVID-19 is new, crisis is not. Even though this is a pandemic that we've never seen before in our lifetime, it's exposing the fact that we are all interconnected and it's exposing how much we rely on our neighbor. And what that says to me, when we think about Cappy Q and, and why I founded it, it's because I believe that companies, public sector philanthropy, we all have an outsized role to play on working together in service of the change we seek. And what I do with my partners every day is to figure out how do you keep impact, whether you're for profit or not, from not being a side hustle, the parsley on the plate, the thing you do on the side, but to what some of the panelists said before, core to your mission, authentically true to who you are. So every day your actions align with what it says that your mission is. And we've gone so long thinking that we can silo our industries and we act one way behind the scenes and another way in service of profit. And we have so much data and research now that shows that when you align passion and profit, you actually can have a stronger planet with stronger returns. So any question I have is me supporting my partner clients on how to really navigate what that looks like operationally. Because it's one thing to say it, it's another thing in terms of choice points and trade-offs and, and questions people have internally to actually do it. So the first question I have from one of my partner clients is, you know, they had embarked on a long-term community change where they were leveraging their assets in ways to improve the lives of their communities. 
because their community was their stakeholders. They were their consumers. And so you do that well, you actually in the end end up having better profit. And so one thing they're struggling with right now is how do they keep honored and true to that long-term community goal while addressing the immediate needs of residents in crisis authentically based on the assets they bring? Who'd like to give me some wisdom on that one? I can take a stab. Ty, that question is very deep, right? And it feels very daunting. Um, so I would take that and then break it down into showing consumers how you are pivoting in this time, right? Um, the client has always been there for the community. I think now is the time to show what they're doing a little bit different to manage the current situation that we're in so that it shows to their stakeholders that they're able to serve their consumers in this time of need, but then also continue to stay committed in that purpose. So staying relevant, but then staying committed to your purpose. Um, the, the two main principles um, that we talked about before. Thank you, Maddie. That's helpful. Um, I, I can, I, I certainly agree with what Maddie said. I think, um, you know, without knowing all the details, it's a little hard to, to give terribly specific advice, but I think that one thing that I learned a long time ago was to think about what are called no regrets decisions. So if you think about different scenarios, uh, you know, you're on one plan, and then as the great business strategist Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face, and now we've been punched in the face, so you go to this new plan. But there may be some things that you would do under any scenario. So I think the first thing to do is to see, are there, are there those kind of no regrets decisions um, that you can still pull the trigger on. I think to the extent, you know, this is maybe easier said, said than done, but I, I think most brands, regardless of, of their focus, are better served by being more relational rather than transactional. And I think the problem um, in a crisis is there's more of a tendency to be transactional um, rather than relational and focused on the long term. So I think if, if you can make it through the short term, uh, and make some of those trade-offs. Um, I think focusing on those relationships, the long-term, um, uh, you know, if you can possibly do it is, is the best thing to do. Steven, without sharing anything of anybody's identities, do you have examples in the crises of a, a re transactional re approach versus a relational approach? Well, I mean, a more, a more um, transactional approach is, I mean, the most, egregious ones, I suppose, are where people raise prices to ridiculous levels when something is in short supply, right? I mean, that's, that's absolutely about getting the most money today and you don't care um, whether you're treating consumers well or, or demonstrating any level of empathy. Um, but I certainly think in, in many cases, like you know, being a retail guy, I think the most obvious one too is whether brands are erring on the side of opening slowly and doing maybe going overboard in terms of being safe, even though that is not necessarily in their short-term economic interest. Thank you, Stephen. So I'm gonna to go to the next question. Real quick, time, time for you. Oh, great, jump in, Chris. Yeah, sorry, I just, I just wanna add two quick things after, after, uh, after that foundation was set. So one, it, the question kind of uh, almost po poses it as binary, kind of how do I, do I continue to think long-term or do I focus on the short-term? And I think as the others have said, you got to continue to do both. Uh, and it may seem hard with all the short term pressures that are there, but that's one thing that I would recommend to everybody is to still carve out time and be thinking about the long term, particularly the scenario planning and think about all the different sort of paths that you may be, uh, that you choose to take or you may be forced to take. So I think that's one thing is to, to make sure you're carving out the time for the strategic planning. And then another thing that, that um, I've observed is that it also might be the time to take some of those things that were in your long-term plans and see if now's the time to accelerate them. So mm -hmm. I'll give you an example, back to your, to your examples. And I hope Jada uh, at Education Opens Doors doesn't, doesn't mind me sharing this, but uh, her organization is about uh, delivering in-person, in-classroom curriculum in eighth grade to create a spark for kids to aspire 
to go to post high school education, either college or vocational school, and to give them a path. These are the steps you take to make that happen. But their whole model was based on delivering in-classroom curriculum. They had had a long-term strategic plan to introduce an online curriculum, but it was always kind of the next step out there because they had shorter term uh, issues to deal with. Uh, this crisis forced them to accelerate that longer term vision. It was existential. They had, to, they had to accelerate it to make it happen now so that they could deliver the curriculum in these periods uh, of time. What it did is it now gave them uh, a better position going forward. They've got two products in their product portfolio. They can do in, uh, um, uh, in, in person curriculum, they can do online curriculum, uh, they can go to schools, they can go to individuals. There's a variety of things they can do. So, this crisis put them in a position to accelerate some long term planning. And so, that would be another recommendation is as people are thinking about this either or, it could be both. It could be let's take that long term idea and now may be the time to accelerate it and put it in place now. Thanks, Chris. I'm so glad you jumped in with that. And that is that is what we advise them to do. So there you go. <laughs> uh, the next question is around a cross-sector partnership uh, that one of our clients is doing that is focused on closing the racial wealth gap by increasing and supporting Black business ownership. So the data and the research behind that is that if only 15% of businesses owned by Black people, and we're talking United States and the broader diaspora, could hire one person, it would translate to 600,000 jobs and $55 billion in the economy. Now, in times of COVID, when everyone's feeling kind of pressed and feel like they don't have access to resources, how can this client best use this momentum to shift the narrative about the importance of Black businesses at a time where everyone is feeling potentially a bit scarcity. Ooh, have we stumped the panel? All right, well, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll jump. Stephen is gonna take a shot at it. <laughs> go Stephen, go. Well, um, and this is probably something you're already doing, but the first thing is I think to really think about the different audiences very, very separately, you know, what, who's, you know, what's, what's the story, the new story you want to tell? Um, who is it for in particular and how should it be told differently that will really motivate them to take action? What I see a lot of times is, is in the quest to be simple or efficient, we only tell one story. Um, and the other part I think is, and this is, if I had to do my career over again, this is the single biggest thing I would probably change is not necessarily assume that the story is going to be mostly about facts and logic. Um, you know, how, how do you connect more emotionally um, with the people you're telling the story to? And how do you tell the story in a way that is, is persuasive and emotionally, in an emotionally connected, connected way? Uh, and that very well could vary to pay, based upon who you're trying to um, persuade, I guess, to take the action you want them to take. I, I would also use this time as an opportunity to um, ex expose and expand upon the mission of an organization, right? So in this particular case, there's a clear mission and it's in, I look at the current COVID crisis and it clearly has exposed um, things that I thought I was already aware of, but I don't think I even realized the depth of income inequality impacts and, and all of those things. So uh, in, in this particular situation, it's actually an opportunity to say this crisis has exposed the need for our mission. And then to just lean into that mission and say, this is why it's so important for this mission to continue. It's so important for you to donate to it. It's so important for this to happen, this to happen, this to happen. So, it, you know, for me, um, it's just that opportunity to, to take that mission and make it even more real by highlighting in this case that this crisis has exposed even more so the need for the mission. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. And, and one of the things that we've been doing is trying to humanize what this looks like for folks. So 
for instance, we, I recently had an op-ed in um, Dallas Morning News and was just sharing what it looks like if you were already not having access to capital, not having the relationships that you needed, and then everyone gets access to PPP, right? If you're a small business owner, well, you were already behind because you couldn't, you didn't have a relationship with a banker. And people are like, oh my God, I thought this money was going to everybody. It's not? Wait, there's structural things in it? Wait, I didn't even know that. And it's kind of creates a burning platform, if you will. But before COVID-19, people might have not been listening in the same way. Mm -hmm. It's helpful. Maddie, were you going to join? Add yeah, something? just as a slight, slightly different take. Um, this is an opportunity where even large corporations are thinking through how do we start acting locally? So while we have global footprints in these large CPGs, we're thinking, how do we invest in our local communities? Because that's what's important to people right now. Um, we're, we're showing that we're, we're seeing the humanity. We're, we're seeing neighbors helping neighbors. Um, we're seeing how businesses, small businesses, um, have a major role to play in, um, in the local community. So I think that's momentum that should hopefully help as well. And Maddie, educate us on what a CPG is. Ah, it's a consumer packaged goods company like a PepsiCo or a Unilever or a P&G. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Ty, could I just add, because Maddie made me think of something. Um, one of the things I think the, the pandemic is doing in particular is it's causing at least the, the organizations that I'm talking to, to rethink the way they think about their target customer. Because, you know, to Maddie's point, I mean, in some cases, there may be new good prospects or new people that have more openness to listen to your message than before for, you know, a whole host of reasons we can probably imagine. And then the other thing is, um, in retail, we often talk about the customer journey, but it could be the decision journey or whatever, whatever way people go from exploring to considering to deciding to engage and we're seeing that shift a lot you know it's certainly a lot easier to to imagine that in the retail context because physical stores are closed and so that's shifting more things to digitally but i suspect in a lot of organizations just the way people are gathering information what they're maybe more open to paying attention to or what will influence in them is shifting so what i've started to to say is basically look at look at your business model what you thought about your target consumer how you reach them what mechanisms you use and just ask your question the question is it still valid um are there new ways to think about it or new tactics to take that that maybe weren't on the table before or like chris was suggesting earlier maybe accelerate something that you were thinking about or experimenting with and, and bring it to life thank you stephen so we have another one of our partner clients who has been partnering with local communities and now there are newly highlighted needs that are surfaced. So for instance, before, let's say they were working on a talent pipeline connection to workforce, and instead they're running into challenges with broadband because now everything is virtual. How would you advise this partner of ours to unite and motivate different art audiences in support of a new goal that's surfaced as a result of this crisis? Well, I'll go first again, if only because I think I'm going to basically build on what I just said, which I think you have to um, dissect the decision journey and how you create value in a new mode. So I would, I would go in for those different constituents or clients and rethink, given you've got a new need emerging, how is it that you're going to, to serve them better? What are, the, what are the points of differentiation you can you can bring to the party. I think that would be the starting point. Um, but then you have to match that obviously against the cost of doing it and whether you can really deliver meaningful value. Yeah, that's such a huge um, daunting problem again, Ty, where I think it requires a systems level change where you have so many stakeholders and it feels intimidating. And so, you know, at my job, we're, we're trying to look at systems changes, approaches, to things like positive water impacts, to um, circular packaging, um, to fighting hunger. And what I'm seeing help 
in this daunting um, task is to break down the functional roles of each stakeholder and to draft what it could look like for a procurement team or a finance team or a marketing team to help tackle this problem. And by just drafting something out, just sketching it out, gives people something to react to and they can say, oh yeah, this is the role I could play in helping solve the systemic issue. And then I, I would add um, th something that is kind of normal in the corporate commercial world, but ends up being provocative in the, in the nonprofit world. Um, and it's th this idea, we talk about these multiple stakeholders of this, this one entity, but the reality is, is there's many of those one entities, particularly in the nonprofit world, you have a lot of entities who are working on similar problems and challenges and those problems and challenges have all equally escalated because of the crisis. And so I think uh, in, the, in the commercial world after 9-11, after the financial crisis, and certainly after this, you're going to see consolidation. You're going to see entities coming together for efficacy, greater efficiency, greater effectiveness. And the provocative aspect of this is that in reality, similar thinking probably needs to take place in a nonprofit world as well, which is how can these different entities come together to solve similar problems and just have greater effort. And that doesn't necessarily mean, okay, we're all going to merge together into one, although there could be some benefits to that. It could just be not just thinking about your stakeholders in your particular question, but are there other like entities who are trying to solve those same broadband problems that we can get together with so that we can create greater efficiency in solving the problem versus 15 people trying to solve it in a bespoke way. So again, that tends to get a little provocative because people don't want to think about their entity not being the sole entity, but just like the commercial world, greater efficacy could come from kind of aligned power, so. No, it makes sense. And in fact, there's um, research that shows that over half of nonprofits in the state of Texas were started after 2000. So that says something about consolidation or at least partnership opportunities. So, you know, a question I have based on what I just heard is, okay, so this is a great opportunity potentially now to raise the profile of issues that people might not have been seeing, to accelerate um, innovation that you might have been putting off, and to authentically engage. How do you do that in light of the signal and noise issue that Stephen had mentioned before? Because it also seems like it's much noisier right now. Well, so I'll be a little bit repetitive, but I, I think the starting point is to really get clarity on um, the the target customer. <laughs> to get, I mean, when you're trying to do a little bit of everything, I'm not suggesting you're doing this, but I see a lot of times this problem of trying to be a little bit of everything to everybody. And I think we have to really, I mean, it's always a good idea, but I think particularly now, really zoom, zoom in on who is this for and what do they really want and how do I help them tell a better story about themselves their organization, whatever they're trying to do. So you have to really, I think, go, go deep in understanding customers, clients, however you, however you think about that. And then what, you know, what are the sort of table stakes things you have to deliver? Because I think the other thing, which I kind of glossed over in my, my intro, but I think one of the things that's become true is the water level, so to speak, has been raised, in terms of expectations and in, in many, many aspects of organizations and marketing. Um, but what are those things you can really amplify? What are those things that are going to really set you apart, that are relevant, that are authentically is uh, tied to your brand? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head what that would look like <laughs> necessarily for, for you or for your clients, but I think if you go deep on understanding who you're trying to serve and what they're going to value the most. And again, you know, what are they going to, what, what's going to be the thing that's so great that they're going to be willing to ideally share that um, with their network and tribes? Um, you know, that's the place to start at least. Yeah, I would just echo what Steve said. It's all about segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Uh, Chris covered that in 15 seconds, um, but that's a full day <laughs> um, uh, class um, in undergraduate marketing 101. Um, 
can't be all things to all people, but you get you could be a lot to to who your target customer and consumer are. Wonderful. Well, do you get? Oh, Chris, were you going to join? Give a suggestion. Nope. I uh, believe it or not, I am not. I'll leave it to those experts. <laughs> <laughs> I will mention one other guidepost. I don't know if this is helpful or not, but one, one of the things that, or two of the things I frequently say in the context of being remarkable is, um, you know, better is not the same as good or remarkable. And I think a lot of times what the second thing is that a slightly better version of mediocre is also not remarkable. And I think what we see a lot of times in the world of innovation or what organizations are trying to do is they're comparing themselves to themselves. Well, we weren't so good at this, now we're a bit better. And that may be an improvement, but in this noisy world, you still may not get noticed. You know, you, ha you have to be able to break through. So if, it, if you need to get to a 10 or an 11, um, to use the Spinal Tap reference, and you know, going from a four to a six is, is not necessarily nearly good enough. And so I think you have to be really rooted in what your customers and clients want, but you also have to be ruthlessly honest with yourself or whether or not this is not just sort of lipstick on the pig or, you know, some little incremental thing that may look good to you, but actually is not going to get much, much attention, much less, much traction with uh, the folks you're hoping to serve. Hey, Ty, and I know in a minute we're going to turn it over to the audience to um, ask any questions they might have, but I thought I'd turn one on you. Like, like, what's the number one question you are getting from your client? I mean, clients, I think they were probably embedded a little bit in the questions you were asking us, but what, what's the number one thing on, that's keeping your clients up at night? You know, it, it is a little bit embedded in some of the questions I asked. The, the tension between the long term and short term has been really challenging. And particularly because most of the time when people are engaging us, they're engaging us, like Maddie said, in a systems change way. What does it look like to build and create the future that we want as opposed to the one that we have? And for a lot of folks, that feels like, ooh, that's a nice to have. But right now we have a lot of short term crises going on. And, and most of my... Um, guidance has been actually now is the time to jump on that. Now is the time where people are feeling the pain that you've been seeing and, and saying for a while. People are looking for different solutions than they had before. At a minimum, people are overwhelmed and someone needs to step in the gap to be the second wave. What is the life after crisis? Because this is going to have a long tail in terms of recovery and we can't be in this short term since urgency mode for what's in front of us right now, or else we won't build something better than what got us here in the first place. What's, what's keeping you up at night in your business? Uh, you know, before I'm very fortunate. I will tell you though, in the first couple of months of this clients stopped calling back, uh, bank account was dwindling and I had done a lot of the things that you're supposed to. So I had, you know, had 12 to 18 months of revenue forecasted. I just hired a full-time person to help with some of that growth. And we just hit a stalemate. And so some of it was, oh my gosh, just how am I, how am I gonna be able to take care of my family? That was the first thing keeping me up at night. And I think now it's just how to make sure I wake up every morning grateful for what I have and creating something better for my kids, you know, yeah, that's great. Uh, for what it's worth, just in observation and working with you over these last uh, few days, uh, getting ready for this, feels to me that your business is well positioned to do three things. Uh, the first one, actually, I think we all tend to skip over, which is, okay, getting ready for the new normal. Now let's do these things. Well, I don't think anybody's defined the new normal yet. And it feels like you are well positioned with your clients to potentially help them define the new normal. And then of course, from that, what is new normal impact and what changes do you make to make that happen? But it just seems like you guys, your business is very well positioned to do those three things for your clients. And if you're delivering that kind of value, then hopefully you can sleep a little bit better uh, at night. You should be able to with what, uh, what the value you're, you're delivering. So. Thank you, Chris. No, that helped. That helps a lot. I started sleeping better once they started calling back. <laughs> yeah, that helps, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna um, turn it over to Prisma because I think we're gonna open it up to everybody else to pick this wonderful panel's brains. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Ty, and all the panelists. We still have some time, and I want to remind everyone um, that you can submit questions. There's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and so you can be submitting questions as um, we continue this conversation. We still have some time to hear from you. Um, and I think, you know, we everything, you know, that was mentioned or has been mentioned thus far, it's very relevant to both nonprofit and for-profit spaces. I know that, um, you know, just in, in working with our SVP advisees, there have been a couple of things that have come up, and, and these are more, you know, questions that, maybe haven't been covered, or maybe there've been parts of them that have been covered. And so I just wanted to throw out, um, you know, I've heard a lot of nonprofits telling me, you, well, you know, how, how can I do marketing? How can I get, you know, how do I do my mission and, and keep marketing well? And, um, you know, do what, how do I do that if, if maybe I don't have a person dedicated to, to marketing, right? And, and so I don't know if you, the panel has any advice um, for these particular nonprofits that are, you know, were already maybe, you know, overwhelmed by their work and then now um, with the COVID situation are, are really like a one or two person show. Um, and, and that could be the case for maybe entrepreneurs and, you know, very small businesses. So I don't know if there's any quick advice the panel can share as we start to receive, um, you know, questions from the audience. I know that as summer is um, right around the corner, we have a ton of undergraduate marketers who are looking for internships and gaining experience. So this might be a time to reach out uh, to some of the local universities to see if there could be some marketing students who might want to gain that experience with working with your nonprofit or your business. One suggestion. Yeah, I think, um, I, I think another is, well, if you don't have a big team, I think you, you're sort of forced to be more hypothesis driven or prototype driven and, and try to use tools and techniques to wrestle those things to the ground. And I think a lot of times you can have cross-functional teams, you can have, um, you know, use your network to get informal advice, but I think you have to really have some very specific ideas um, and issues you're trying to wrestle to the ground and bounce off of those, those people, but try to think, you know, it's kind of a, some people on the call are probably familiar with lean startup mode, but I think it's trying to use some of those, those techniques to move through things more quickly without it having to be a big project or require lots of people um, to, to either weigh in on or, or take major tasks. Great. Um, Chris, do you have anything else to add? No, I'm good. Otherwise, what, we'll go to some questions and actually um, we have one that, you know, also I've heard that from different nonprofits, um, you know, I've had some nonprofits in our portfolio tell, tell me like, do I need to go after influencers? And so we actually have a question from the audience that says, is it more powerful for others such as influencers to tell your story than you? Um, you know, if yes, how do you go about doing that? And, you know, are influencers, you know, like on social media or, or, you know, and just with these um, big networks, are they, how important is it to use influencers now or ever, I guess? Yeah. For, for me, it goes a bit back to the authenticity uh, aspect of, of your messaging uh, and your storytelling. I think today, even more so, there's, that kind of pressure to be authentic. And in many cases, you as the founder of your organization, the, the creator of its original mission, there's not really anybody more authentic than that. And as you start to sort of outsource that, you, you tend to, well, there's a risk you lose some of that authenticity. So I guess that's a long way of saying that my personal view is that in these times, in these times, um, you as the, as the, founder, the operator of the, of the, of the mission, um, your voice is going to be very important in, in setting direction for your team, setting uh, clarity for your donors, all those kinds of things. Uh, to the degree which you can augment that, complement that with potentially influencers who can credibly, you know, uh, expand your message, uh, then yeah, uh, I think that, that always makes sense to do that. But it needs to be credible, it needs to be authentic, or else it's going to get lost in all that noise that Steve was talking about uh, earlier. So anyway, that, that's just my view. 
I, have, I actually have a slightly different take depending on if you are an individual or like institution versus if you're a collaborative. So I feel like the answer for that is the people who are living the experience of the change you're trying to seek are often the better storytellers for whether or not it's working. And it's this partnership between your collaborative is the platform that provides those stories, a place to land. And if it's, if it's nuanced to those stories, if you see them from different perspectives, that actually is probably more powerful than the collaborative saying, look at how we're solving child hunger, right? It's the children and the families experiencing child hunger that actually make people believe that, which is just different if you're a collaborative versus individual institutions. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's yeah. very situation specific. I mean, one of the most bizarre things, right, is you have people that listening uh, before they go to a restaurant, or before they plan a trip, you have, you know, lots of people are listening to what all sorts of people you don't even know uh, say about that, that hotel or restaurant, right? So you've got that scenario where what's on Yelp or TripAdvisor or whatever is more powerful, perhaps, than what the brand itself is saying about them. Um, in other cases, anything that Kim Kardashian says, or, um, you know, Kylie Jenner or whomever is automatically a hit, right? So you've got real, real polarity. So yeah, I think you have to get down to the individual circumstances, um, the people that are most legitimately connected in a better position to share their authentic experience. Um, and you know, you have to pay some attention to what their what their network or tribes look like to, to get a sense of whether that will be amplified. In general, I'm seeing a lot of pulling back on, and, and Maddie's probably in a better position to comment on this, you know, just in terms of uh, big budgets going towards influencers, because I think they're finding that, you know, that now as we can measure it a little bit better, that it's not necessarily paying off as well as perhaps uh, originally was thought. I don't know, Maddie, I didn't mean to like redirect a new question to you, but. I think you're close no, I'm not, actually, I'm not working with influencers. Um, it's more about connecting with social impact organizations, more so than than shiny influencers. Yeah, and and I, I would like to just go back to to Ty's comment, right? That that your client, the the the, the customer or in the recipient of your 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 impact to me is in a different category than influencer as we've, as we've been, as we've been describing, there's a general rule of thumb that your, your customers, uh, they can tell your story uh, better and with, with greater authenticity than you can because people identify themselves in, in, in the, in those customers and stuff. So absolutely. If you can get uh, uh, clients or, uh, you know, recipients of your, of your impact to, to participate in your storytelling. That's, that's incredibly powerful. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we have another question from the audience. I know, um, you know, it says um, outside of conversations, um, what are some creative strategies that we can use to engage our target customers to better understand their evolving needs? I saw this question come in from my friend, Lisa Weaver, and I don't know the answer to this one. Mm -hmm. um, more than talking to people, I don't know how you do this. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm glad Maddie went first because I'm not <laughs> sure I have a compelling, <laughs> compelling answer. I mean, I do, I do generally think that um, as much as I'm a big fan of, of customer research of all sorts, a lot of times consumers don't really know what they want or will say one thing and do another. So I think observing behavior, um, which there are various ways of doing that depending upon what sort of organization you have is, is perhaps sometimes more valid than what customers will tell you they're going to do. The other thing which may be a little bit off from the question is, you know, one of the things that I've, I've seen happen over the last few years is there's a lot more of exporting of ideas across different businesses. So I think if you are paying attention to customer experience trends or innovation trends or what have you in slightly different, maybe related kinds of organizations, you can sometimes make, make inferences um, from there. And that might give you some ideas for things you can experiment with. And then you experiment with them and you see the reaction 
you get from your customers as opposed to necessarily having a conversation with them. That's a little bit different. That's more like prototyping kind of, <laughs> kind of question. But um, yeah, usually you have to, you have to talk to your customers. <laughs> yeah. And it may, and maybe it's more, uh, it might also just be, are there new creative ways to talk to customers? And obviously we're engaging in a conversation and dialogue right now that, um, you know, is, is a great way to, to have a conversation. It's just different than one-on-one -on -one and collecting individual information. So just the idea of essentially a, a zoom focus group uh, where you can just have a conversation that gets lots of different perspectives at one time that, you know, that may create some efficiencies in the conversations, but it's really hard to think of something that completely replaces a, a conversation. Yeah. I mean, there are, I mean, the, if you want to sort of get, get a little further out there, I don't know how relevant this is to, to most of the people on the call, but I mean, there are a lot of companies using artificial intelligence to make inferences about, about customer behavior. So you can, you can, you know, get, get ideas about things that might work or what people are really doing um, using some pretty sophisticated technology, but that's, that's still kind of in its nascent state and, and maybe not accessible to most folks quite yet. Great. Um, well, in terms of, uh, you know, additional questions, I know that we've talked about and, and Ty in particular, you've highlighted some of the realities that, you know, we've had inequities, right? That, that's why we have um, organizations that are out there trying to make, you know, changes. And so um, in terms of, you know, race and, and gender, and I know you, you wrote an op-ed about black businesses and, you know, just the struggle and, and how much uh, we see it a lot more, right? Um, it's, it's definitely exposed. Um, do you feel that um, companies have a responsibility to, to weave in their messaging some of these um, gender or, or major, you know, race um, issues? Do, they, do companies have a responsibility to weave this in their messaging and, you know, into their marketing? And, and you know, I don't know if you could speak to those um, issues and how that's important now. Sure. I think, I think what is companies are responsible for is applying an equity lens to their practice. And so whether that means speaking about it externally to the audiences it depends on, on, you know, kind of what some of the other folks have said on the scenario, but, you know, perfect example with PPP, there, there are several things that you could do knowing that this virus is, is disproportionately affecting communities and families and people of color and going back and reflecting on what are the practices that actually exacerbate that that inequity. So for PPP, for instance, there are three things that financial institutions could have done differently. You know, one is they needed to partner with community-based organizations. So that was either community development, financial institutions, local banks, basically who's the proxy or the credible and authentic connector to community. Because the way that the law or the way that the um, opportunity was set up actually set you up where if you had an existing relationship with the government, if you had an existing relationship with a large financial institution, it took you out of the running to even get, get money. So you, you can't just be like, oh, well, sorry, that money didn't land where it was supposed to. You have to say, who might not be getting this money and who can we partner with? Um, the second is to actually align your incentives with the needs of your bar borrowers. And I think this goes back to the mission conversation and the authenticity conversation. Typical banking is about taking fees. So you could take 100% of your fees up front and that would say, okay, it would move me to be more focused on larger customers. And it wouldn't make me worry about whether or not somebody paid this back, that's on them. As opposed to really thinking about What's the average dollar size that's really gonna hit the communities that need the most? How am I making sure I'm incentivizing my team to be focusing on borrowers of maybe smaller revenue sizes and also splitting that fee? So when the second half of the fee is actually, have you gotten that loan forgiven and or have you been able to repay it? Which leads to the third thing, which is really education. You know, Now in times of crisis, people are more like, oh, wow, how would a small business owner know how to navigate this? Or what if they didn't have a financial resource in their team to be able to navigate this? That's the case for most small business, frankly, regardless of race or gender, but even more so for women and people of color. 
And so you really have a responsibility for it, even if it's not you as a financial institution, who is educating that borrower as they go through the process so they're making the right choices? Because the PPP has a, a few clauses in it that could actually put you worse off than when you started. Those are all the types of things that if you do well, your brand can say, we really do partner with the community and we've taken ourselves a step above what the government has asked us to make sure that we're meeting the folks who need it most. Does anyone else have, thank you, Ty, that was um, great to hear. And in particular with the PPP loan, because we get, you know, a lot of questions about that and, you know, it does relate, um, you know, what, what systems are already in place and how the, they don't necessarily um, make it easier for some groups. Um, Maddie, Chris, Steve, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Um, otherwise, we'll um, jump into a, another question. And I'm looking at time, but um, we probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, you know, just working with so many nonprofits and um, we keep hearing about, and this one, you know, relates a little bit more to fundraising maybe, but, um, you know, we hear about events and how there's, um, you know, like at what point do I have to announce, like, you know, my event is, is changed or it's canceled or, you know, there, or even looking into the future of like, you know, uh, how do I send to save the date? So we have a, a question, you know, that came to us from the audience and, you know, just generally how long um, should organizations wait or, you know, should they be thinking ahead and pivoting, um, you know, before sending to save the date and releasing like, here's um, some collateral on my, you know, on my event coming up soon. I, I guess from my, my perspective is, is that the, the world has changed as it relates to that, that, that particular question. You know, a year ago, it would be really important to put a date and hit that date and don't change it for fear of looking, you know, unprepared and all that. Well, today people understand better. I mean, my daughter's graduation has changed three times. A year ago, that would have driven me crazy. And now I just am hopeful she gets a graduation. Right. And so I, I think that your, 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 your customers, your attendees are going to have an understanding that nothing is guaranteed at this point. And I still think there's value in putting a date out there um, and then adjusting as you get closer to it if, if you need to. With that said, I also think there's just your own internal efficiency and where you focus and those kinds of things and just a creeping delay, just something that just keeps moving and moving and moving can be uh, you know, just as impactful to you internally, uh, uh, in addition to kind of your external uh, audiences as well. So, you know, you probably have to put some thought into uh, two paths, uh, at which point do, do I just cancel it and skip over it? Or which point do I pivot to another version of it, an online version of it, whatever it might be. Um, so I think both of those things are in play there. <clears throat> You know, what I, I would add, well, one of the funniest things was, and I'll briefly plug my book, but when I wrote my book last year, um, the last chapter is called A Brave New World. And it's mostly about accepting that it's very hard to really know anything for sure and that we need to be agile and that, you know, one of the quotes is the waves are going to keep on coming. We need to learn how to surf. And I never thought when I wrote that it would be so much more amplified in the current current environment. But I think as it relates to events, first of all, I don't think anybody has any idea what the future is gonna look like. Um, I think we could be perpetually moving physical events down the road. And so I would generally say, if it's a really important event, like an annual fundraiser or whatever, I would generally be in favor of picking the date and just accepting that it may very well be a virtual or a hybrid event. And, and plan accordingly. I certainly can't say that for every single situation, but I think if you're planning to do something in the fall, I mean, I, I you know, by, my uh, primary source of revenue last year was getting paid to speak at big conferences and every single one of them has been canceled in the first half of the year. And most of them are basically planning for them to be virtual if they have to be. And they'll take it as a lucky thing if they can do it in person. And so I think that's just the world we're in for, for probably quite some time. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, coming from the same person, I, I know that they ask about a good relationship and, you know, I don't know if um, Steve or Chris or Maddie or even Ty, if you have anything else to add, but I know, I think part of that 
you know, transparency or having that communication probably is how you maintain a, a good relationship with your donor or consumer. Um, so I, I don't know if there's other ways um, that any of you want to share. Sure, I can, I can hop in. I mean, call them, <laughs> reach out to them and be honest. Um, one of the things that I've seen from donors is they've actually shifted a lot of their practices. Several national funders I've been working with and even local funders, they are um, being less stringent with reports. They are, if you have a multi-year grant, they're pulling the dollars up forward. They're open more to general operating expenses than they used to be. They're investing in things that have nothing to do with what their initial mission was because the needs are bubbling up around child care and food security that weren't there before. And so they're trying to be good stewards right now and good partners and you giving them information about what you need to be successful is actually helping them be better partners. Yeah, yeah, thank I, you. I would just remind that back to the, the marketing fundamentals, um, you know, your promotional mix, that storytelling, that, that is about as establishing and strengthening relationships. And on one level, one tool in the toolkit is a bit more passive. The advertising model is not very deep and interpersonal. But then, of course, personal selling is very deep and interpersonal from a relationship perspective. And I guess I would just, you know, it's a statement of the obvious, but just remember that you've got a, a wide set of tools in that in that relationship toolkit to keep those relationships going. And and your most important donors, you're gonna to want to do that in personal selling, the personal phone calls and relationships, things like that. But other, a broader net of donors keeping your mission alive and and living in front of them. You've got different tools in your toolkit to to do that. And and it may not feel like relationship building like a personal call does, but it it's keeping that relationship alive. So just use your full toolkit. Um, uh, as you're looking at those relationships. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we have a couple more questions. I, I know that we're um, close to time, but I did want to, you know, ask this question in terms of startups and just um, acquiring new consumers, um, maybe in the case of nonprofits, new donors, um, you know, uh, they're doing a lot of online content, right? We're all um, trying to get ourselves out there, um, you know, making sure that we're, um, you know, we're relevant. And so in terms of like monetizing this online content, we have a question specifically about that, like how, you know, how to do that. And then, um, you know, how to do that among all the noise that maybe, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people doing that. Um, and so I don't know if there are any suggestions or, or comments about that. I mean, my honest answer to it right now is good luck because it's just, which is not a very helpful answer, but it's just, you know, it is such a difficult environment um, to do that. Prices are coming down, uh, the noise is going up. And so it's, it's pretty hard to do in, in so-called normal times. Um, I think right now, um, I, I would focus more, which is easy for me to say, because I'm not paying the bills at a startup, but I would, I would focus on providing value without getting paid first and build a platform and then follow with ways to monetize it. I think if your singular focus is monetizing it, you, you probably are not going to be as successful and um, in terms of connecting with ultimate consumers, but also I think just the environment's especially difficult to, to do that. And I think we're going to be in that environment for, for a while. Yeah. I mean, I want you to echo that one. Once something is free, it, it becomes hard to to monetize. Um, there's ways to do it, and it all comes to what Steve said, which is continue to add more and more value to that. So at the point when you introduce your monetization model, people know the value of it, and they're they're willing to, uh, or some of them, not all of them, some of them are willing to to pay for that. And then you've just got sort of classic decisions to make on monetization. Do you want to monetize each individual piece of content or do you want to go to a subscription model where bundles of content come in? You know, there's a variety of, of different ways to, uh, to monetize. So it, it, while, you're, while you're in a free mode, <laughs> you're going to need to focus on how you want to introduce and the best way to introduce your monetization. Yeah. Well, um, any, Maddie, anything else, Ty? Anything else to add that, to that question? I think with that, you know, I know that we have lots of questions and we have one more. And that one, I, 
I already had planned on asking, you know, what, what, you know, have you learned or what's your biggest takeaway from the last eight weeks? And I know in the, from the audience, we hear, okay, well, we know that we've been hearing, we're in this together, we're, we're all living the same experience. And so, you know, we have a question that from the audience that says, well, you know, we know that life is deeper than that. So what's next? So if each of the panelists could just share with us, you know, one big thing maybe that they've learned or, or experienced and, also, what do you think is next? Um, you know, and that's a hard one to answer, but, um, you know, if you could just give it a shot and we'll go around. I've learned that people will rise to the occasion in terms of creativity when there are constraints put upon them. So I'm inspired to see brands kind of step up in this, this new normal and figure out how can we adapt and provide value to consumers' lives given the situation that we're in. So I'll keep mine short and simple. Yeah, I would, um, as much as, as much as I see a lot of behavior that makes me cynical, I would say the overwhelming thing is that deep down, um, most people are inherently compassionate and can demonstrate empathy. And I think we've just, uh, probably similar to what Maddie was getting. I think we've, we've seen people really rise to all sorts of different, different occasions, um, to help each other out. Yeah, and for for me, I I, I come back to authenticity. Um, you know, actually embedded in that question was we've seen a lot of companies step forward and start talking about we're in this together. Well, there's a concept back in the environmental uh, focus days of called greenwashing, where companies would just come out and attach themselves to the cause at hand, uh, and it wasn't authentic, and they got rooted out if your actions didn't meet your words and. And you're starting to feel a little of that and some some of the marketing advertising that's going on out there it feels like it's just kind of glomming on to the to the issue at hand and and for me the biggest takeaway is is resist the temptation to do that is is you've got to be very authentic in how you attach your voice your brand voice everything you're doing from your marketing to uh, uh to what is happening right now and we see it everywhere across product services we certainly see it across politics where you see authentic sort of brand voices and you see inauthentic brand voices. So my big, biggest takeaway is the winners are going to be the authentic uh, brand voices. And I, I, I echoing a lot of what people said, but I, I think it starts with us. We're all in this together means each one of us is pushing forward the place that we can to make the, the change that we want to see. And that might sound trite and cliche, but I would say, hold on to this feeling, this feeling of shared fates, this feeling of what it means to witness someone else's suffering and see yourself in it. And then hold on to the person next to you, even if it's virtually on saying, what could we do differently? So we're not experiencing that. And, and I think there's so much of the power that we have within ourselves, not just in our institutions and in ourselves as individuals, that in the seat you're in, your voice and your change can actually help create what you want to see. Thank you. Those are um, great responses. I know, um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and we don't, it's not an on and off button where we can just jump out of the um, crisis situation necessarily. Um, so with that, you know, I know we, we have about a minute left and so I want to wrap up you know, thanking our panelists, our organization, CAP EQ, and we will continue to have some of these workshops, um, SVP Dallas workshops um, in the coming months um, relating to different topics. Um, you know, Social Venture Partners is an organization that believes in engaged philanthropy, and we're bringing business leaders together, and um, we hope to magnify impact, um, you know, across nonprofit and, and for-profit organizations. And so, you know, if you'd like to learn more about how to become a partner, if you're one of those individuals that is looking to give back at this time, you know, please um, reach out to us. Um, or if you're an organization that is looking for additional support on how to magnify your impact, um, you know, we're, we're here for you. And so you can visit us online at www.sbcdallas.org. And 
we want to thank you for joining us. And I know that there's so many highlights and, and points that stood out to me. You know, uh, in particular, I was remembering the video that Maddie showed, and it said, um, in Spanish, it said, and I wrote it down, todo lo que venga, which is everything that may come. And so thank you for joining us today, and um, we will be in touch. Um, please join us for the future response webinar that will be on Zoom um, next week on May 19th. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Prisma. Thanks, everyone.